the roadmap that I actually created in my book, Awaken Your Wealth, is how to work through it, is the, I call it the PACT system, P-A-C-T. Um, the first step is you have to dream the new dream. Because if we keep focusing on the reality that we've created financially or in our life in other areas, we keep then recreating the past in the present moment. Okay, the second step is you have to accept the reality that you've created because you have to create the space for the new to actually funnel through. But if you're holding like a chokehold and smothering who you are because you have all this blame and guilt and judgment around what you've created, you're actually putting a noose around it so that it can't expand. So in that acceptance, which I always say that the acceptance piece is so important. The third step to the process is you have to commit to choose to change. And the fourth step is actually taking those action steps to go. Once we start to understand the energy of money and start to use it to our benefit and not to our detriment, then manifestation occurs and plenty comes to you. Hello and welcome to Help Me, I'm Human, the self-help podcast that talks about psychology through the lens of spirituality. And I'm Connie Rose, a happiness and addiction coach. I help you have healthy relationships with you, people, food, and substances. And if you're listening to this on the 25th or the 26th, you have about two days left to apply to my group coaching program starting Thursday called Inner Power and Self-Love Activation. And there's a few spots left so you can follow the link in my profile or below. And today I'm so excited because today we are blessed with an amazing guest, Julie Murphy, who is the author of two incredible books, Emotion Behind Money mm -hmm. and Awaken Your Wealth. Mm -hmm. And she's been a financial planner for over 25 years. And I first <laughs> discovered Julie um, through Aaron Dowdy on his podcast and Julie and I met at Aaron Dowdy's retreat actually um, recently in Costa Rica, which was incredible. I know. <laughs> welcome, Julie. So happy thank to you. have you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate being here. Good stuff. So, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about money, <laughs> which is one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> it, it affects so much, and so many people have got so many hang ups about it, and there's so much struggle in the world, and people find it very hard to figure it out, including me. <laughs> so, yeah. I have a lot of questions today too. So, so <laughs> well, and it kind of fits in with the uh, help me, I'm human part, right? Because money is literally the third dimension practicality of how we plug into the world. And we so often turn our personal power over to money of why we do things and don't do things. And we have to realize that money is actually just the result of those things that we choose to do or not to do. So, so I, I've um, been around a lot of wealthy, very wealthy people in my life. I didn't grow up wealthy um, at all. And there was a lot of arguments in my house about money and actually my parents sure broke up over money mm. um, and um, and so it's I, I realized I had a lot of uh, inner conflicts about money because my mum is an overspender and my dad is very stingy with money and like holds on tightly right. and my dad taught me that money is bad like it's bad to have too much and um, and so I had to like deal with that conflict because I realized that um, you know, the more money you have, the more you can give, right? Right. Um, so what, how do you help people work through those childhood influences? Well, I, well, the first step is, is um, we have to interrupt the pattern, right? So, uh, and this is the roadmap that I actually created in my book, Awaken Your Wealth, is how to work through it, is the, I call it the PACT system, P-A-C-T. Um, the first step is you have to dream the new dream. Because if we keep focusing on the reality that we've created financially 
or in our life in other areas, we keep then recreating the past in the present moment. So the biggest way to start is to dream the new dream. And then you need to, the second step is you have to accept the reality that you've created because you have to create the space for the new to actually funnel through. But if you're holding like a chokehold and smothering who you are because you have all this blame and guilt and judgment around what you've created, you're actually putting a noose around it so that it can't expand. So in that acceptance, which I always say that the acceptance piece is so important because you not only have to accept what you've created because you are the creator of your life, you also need to wake up your authenticity at the same time. And then the third step to the process is you have to commit to choose to change. Like, and that, that is, it's almost an energetic thing that you need to do. Meaning like you're going to be tested on those old limiting beliefs to go back down that path. The universe will give you all kinds of opportunities to go back to your old patterning, but you have to say, Oh no, I'm choosing differently. And then the fourth step is actually taking those action steps to go, okay, I'm finally in a place where I can observe that now I can see where I'm being tested and go the new path, then choose the new path by taking action steps that probably scare the crap out of you because they're the new pieces that you have to go and you're on. I'm not really sure if this is going to work out, but, uh, and trust that it's going to start to actually the result of running through this process will be that more abundance and more financials come to you to support more of what you know authentically is you in the world. I know it's a lot, it's a lot, but it's a process and it's a, it's an ongoing process, meaning that, um, once you peel the onion one layer, well, then you got to go deeper and then you got to go deeper. You know, I have my, my next book is coming out in the next month. It's called the four spiritual laws of money. And it talks about how we get to these, we're climbing the hill and then we get to a summit and it's like, Oh, I got to climb the hill again. And then there's another summit. And you can choose to have that be like a linear line, or you can choose for it to be a quantum leap as you're taking that action. And it really just depends how you can surrender into your own fears. And that's busting through those limiting beliefs. So how important do you think attachment is to money and, and how much we bring in? Yeah. So attachment is all about, um, not being willing to feel the grieving along the way, right? So we stay attached to things because we actually are trying to distract ourselves from feeling, right? So we attach and then that becomes our story. And then we reinforce what we don't necessarily want to create. So, um, that can work to your detriment or it could work to your advantage. So it depends on what you're attaching to, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a constant process. One of the exercises I walk people through and I just gave my group coaching team, uh, the assignment that they, this week they had to go burn their vision boards and they're like, what? Like, but that's the dream. I'm like, yeah, now you need to detach from the dream, right? So it's a good thing that you attach to your dreams. It was a good thing, but those two can become suffering patterns. If you hold on to that too tight, right? And so you have to let it go. You have to detach and allow the universe or God, whatever your deity is, like you have to allow that to take the ball and run with it. Your job is to set the intention and to put those balls in motion and then take the action step as the synchronicities of life start to show up. You have to like be able to be willing to take those steps as then the universe, God put those things in your pathway. Um, but if you're attached, you may not see those things, right? Because you're too attached to how it's supposed to show up, right? And it's like, it never shows up the way you think it's supposed to show up ever, 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 ever. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, cause what I've been confused about is that I've looked I've cause I've been around all these wealthy people. I I've noticed that it doesn't seem how much wealth you attract or have doesn't seem to be related to how intelligent you are or how, um, or how look on YouTube, right? Just look on YouTube of how many people do stupid tricks and their $23 million is their net worth. And you're like, you're doing stupid game. Like nothing that's like brilliant. Like it's not Elon Musk brilliant, 
but you're worth $23 million because you're just doing something that's higher vibration that people are attracted to because it's all energy. Right. But then what about people that do, that are like, there's a lot of unkind people in the world that are really wealthy. So it doesn't seem to be about like how kind or giving you are necessarily, which so a lot of these financial like abundance people say, you just need to give more and then you'll attract more. But how? <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> first of all, we have a global limiting belief that to do what your heart desires that you don't make money. So there is a limiting belief pattern in our world, <coughs> pardon me, that first we have to let that disintegrate because you absolutely can follow your heart as well as be wealthy. So there's a limiting belief pattern that needs to, uh, to go away. I talk about, this is actually in my next book, that it's the embodiment of what I call real wealth that um, I categorize people in different areas of how they've shown up in the world financially. So you could be poor, you could be a debtor, somebody who struggles with debt patterns. You can be a dreamer, meaning that, oh my God, I got the dreams and I'm going and you just keep chalking up and dreaming the next dream. The problem is, is you're dancing between growing abundance, financial wealth and scarcity because you do this dance with debt still, right? Because debt, debt is a lack of freedom. And then you have the accumulators where they use debt as a healthy instrument, right? Like your mortgage and things of that nature. Um, and they've started to accumulate assets and then you become wealthy where you're financially independent enough that you wouldn't necessarily have to work anymore because your interest on your money could provide your lifestyle. What I've come to realize that anyone who is in the poor, the debtors, the dreamers or accumulators, they all believe that there's this linear line that once you get too wealthy and you are happy and that couldn't be farther from the truth, right? That's kind of to your point, right? Mm -hmm. That I don't necessarily see it. So when I'm talking to people who are independently wealthy, it's about the fact that they have to embody what I call real wealth, which it's about living from your heart and then add your smarts. So do the stuff that is in line with your heart and then the money shows up and then have your money then more amplify what it is that you want to create in the world. Now, that all being said, what do you do when you're a poor or debtor, dreamer or an accumulator? You're like, oh, I'm like struggling. I just want to be wealthy. Like, I just want this independence. I know abundance is there for me. I know prosperity is there for me, but what the hell? And it's because we haven't found that place of contentment in wherever it is that your reality that you have. And that is where the acceptance piece and the second step that I walk people through is so important because you have to accept whatever reality that you've created thus far and then follow what's in alignment with your heart. I always tell people to follow their giggle, like do whatever makes them feel levity and light and do more of that as opposed to things that are daunting because that is your body intelligence trying to tell you, go this way, come on, we're trying to get you here. Otherwise, if you don't do that, you create disease in your bodies and you create more bigger crises to show up in your life to give you that hit over the head to go, go that way. Your giggle can show you to go that way bef way before the crisis ever comes. Like you don't have to OD on whatever you're addicted to, to get, you don't have to call in that crisis, but if you don't listen to your heart, you will call in that crisis, right? Like this is how it works. And it is not a linear line. And we have to understand that you absolutely can quantum leap. But if you don't follow your authenticity, which is your heart and your soul in what makes you feel good today to, go, to align with, no matter how many people you're gonna disappoint, no matter how many people try to pull you back in your own pattern, because they're more comfortable with you being in your old patterning, right? Because you have to understand that just means that's about them, not about you. One of the biggest things I teach along the way is that if you're triggered by somebody else's behavior, that means you have to shift inside of you. It's not about the other person. And so 
It's about finding this profound sense of freedom, which is what I call real wealth and contentment in your current reality. That's what creates more expansion. That's what creates more financial wealth. Because if you're not looking at wealth from not only your financial life, but your personal life, your family life, and your work life, Something's going to pay the price. So you talked about, well, I know real jerks that have tons of money. But you know what? They've been divorced three times. They're super lonely because they're by themselves. So they didn't embody real wealth. So how do you have it all? It's, all, it's about having it all, not just about the money piece. Because in the end, I've met plenty of trust fund babies that have trust funds that are over $100 million here in the United States that they're not happy. And everybody else thinks, well, I'd be damn happy if I had $100 million. Nope. Why? Because they're not living their lives. According to them, they're living their lives based on family expectations of how you're supposed to show up in the world because you don't want the money to fall away. And I've helped so many people, even those multimillionaires and trust fund babies, to go, well, what do you want? You know, I had this one woman, if, if I could give an example of that, because we who, people who don't have $100 million feel like once I get there, I'm going to be satisfied. And, and I'm here to tell you that's not going to happen. I've seen it so many times with people that I coach too, like the multi, multi-millionaires. And they're like, they get to that wealth and they think that it's going to bring them the happiness. But they're like, oh, I got here. And why am I not happy still? <laughs> like, exactly. They didn't re- I think it's because they didn't realize that the abundance really comes from within like it's all from you right yeah it's like that i i have um the subtitle of my emotion behind money book it says build wealth from the inside out and i have that inside the heart because it's about your heart and what your heart desires and so as an example i have this one client she was uh, her grandfather created a company and every grandchild and child and great-grandchild they all have you know over a hundred million dollar trust funds but grandpa grew up in middle america just happened to do a patent on something that took off and when i met her she's like the family screw up and they just try to tell her you stay out of the business you like and they just boss her around all day long and she comes to me and she's like well i don't have any control over my life they just allow me to have the interest on my money but she's like flailing and her her family's given her all this shame of who she is and in the process of me working with her what we realized was she is her grandfather she's the original entrepreneur she has this creative and innovative side of her that her grandfather had that everybody else in the established business think is kooky as all hell and i go we have to scratch that itch so she started doing things like she goes, what do you mean? And I go, well, what is your dream? What do you want to create? And she goes, you know, I really want to create people's homes to be their sacred spaces. I'm like, okay. And it's kind of a spinoff of what grandfather's business was, which was furniture, right? It was a, a, a patent on some furniture stuff. And uh, that almost every human being in the world uses today. And... Um, so she started buying like a $2 million home and turning it into a $6 million home by really making it a sacred space, like play rooms for people to meditate or like things that really helped like elevate your consciousness. And she could get a line of credit. They would only give her a million dollars to do this. I'm like really at a hundred million dollars. They gave her 1%. And I'm like, okay, so we're going to do your first gig. And then we're going to give the million dollars back to the hundred million. She goes, well, why would I give it back after they gave it to me? I'm like, just to prove that you could do it on your own. Yeah. Amazing. And she turned around and, um, that, uh, she now does this. She actually went to a place of where she lives in the country. She now bought up almost because what was happening in this resort town, the middle class was being pushed out and she kind of did. You ever see the movie? It's a wonderful life. So she became George Bailey. She bought up all this land in this town that really only wealthy people can stay in. And she now rents modest homes to all the working class people. And she's capped all the rents so that 
they can still afford to live in this beautiful place in the country. And so like, she, this is the give back, right? Because she's creating these sacred spaces on one side, but then she's helping middle America on the other side to be able to afford to be in this beautiful place that, you know, wealth usually pushes people out of. And she's providing it for like 250 families in this town. And her family is just like sitting here going like this. And she's providing this beautiful, beautiful space. And so I'm here to tell you that the money is not necessarily going to create the happiness. You have to create the happiness and then, you know, the wealth comes more and more and more and it'll amplify the more you do that. Because I've also watched people or trust fund babies. If you're not in alignment with your heart and soul, that money, like this girl was very lucky that while she was in her addictions and in her process of like, she, she went down dark paths, right? Because we go down dark paths and we sabotage our lives when we're not in alignment with our heart and our soul. And she, grateful that her family didn't let her bust the trust fund. There are other trust fund babies I've seen that don't have a dime today because they went to zero. That's why 87% of the time, by the time money hits the fourth generation, all the money's gone because they haven't built the financial muscles to hold money in abundance because they didn't build it in the first place. They don't know how to do it. That's like um, how so many lottery winners lose it really quickly, right? And then like a, a millionaire, if they lose it, they'll often make it back because they- Exactly. Right. It's about, do you, have you built the financial muscles to hold money in abundance? And when you're given a wherewithal and you're like, <gasps> it's like a fire hose, like you don't energetically know how to hold all that energy because money is energy. And so you have to build the muscle of how to hold it. And so that's one of the biggest things that people can do is continue to set the intention that I am holding money in abundance. I am holding money in abundance because you have to, or I'm building the muscles to hold in abundance of what you want to create. Because you can say, I want a million bucks, but if you don't know how to hold a million bucks, you're going to have a leaky container and that million bucks is going right back out the door because you're going to declare bankruptcy because you would have made a decision that causes that leaky container. And you got to plug those leaky container holes, which yeah. is no different than like if you're addicted to drugs, right? Like if you're addicted to something, you don't go to a party where they're serving it all, right? Like <laughs> you kind of need to steer clear of those things because those are leaky containers too, right? Whatever those things are, right? Yeah, because I, in my 20s, like I, I went up and down with wealth a lot. I was able to attract large amounts that, and then I was like, oh, this is going to continue forever. And then I lost it all very quickly. So I went like up and down a lot of the time. So was how, what, what would you say to me? Back yeah, so there is a difference. I want people to recognize that there is income affluence and then there's asset affluence. So the first step to building your muscles in abundance is getting used to income affluence. So what you just described was income affluence. You're like, you learned how to manifest and attract it, but then you didn't know how to hold it. Yeah. Right. So it's both of those, right? So there are a lot of people like abundance has, you know, the average wealth of, you know, anyone around the world, whether it's China, America, Europe, that is increasing, right? We have learned to generate more income than any other generation prior to us, right? And the question is now, is now that you've figured out how to be income affluent, how do you now stay asset affluent? And that's where the asset affluence piece is all about, like you wouldn't have had that go out the leaky container, because that's what I call a leaky container. You, it all went out the door because you had a leaky container because you didn't have intention behind that money that funded the dreams of what you want to create in the future and not only put it in one area you have to sprinkle the infield so you're building up a base so that your foundation gets stronger and stronger and stronger and holding that abundance so that, yeah i was going to say you break that down into cleaning up your financial past while living in the present moment and planning for the future all at the same time so let me give an example. So let's just say your income affluence was, um, you're bringing in, I'm just going to use a number of $10,000 a month. And this is just, so it's an equal number so I can follow the math quickly. 
and your expenses are, let's say, four grand a month. So you have an extra six grand that came in that month. Well, intentionally with that extra money, you want to hit all cylinders. I tell people to hit a third, a third, a third. You want to take a third and pay off your highest interest rate debt that you have because your debts are your financial past choices. So you take a third, you do that. If you don't have debt, you don't cut it in thirds and you cut it in half. So if you're cutting it in thirds, so that's six grand that's extra, 2,000 goes to paying off your past. 2,000 goes in your cash flows in the present moment, which means go piss that money away. Go have fun with it, scratch that itch. Like I'm sure you got some spending goals, the problem is, is when people get the extra cash, they usually do it like, oh, I've been sacrificing for so long, so I gotta go get this new car. I gotta go get that Prada purse. I gotta go get that pair of shoes. I gotta go, and then we piss it away, right? But I'm saying, scratch the itch, still reward yourself while you clean up your past and plan for the future and have some fun today. So that's why, in that example, $2,000 goes to cleaning up your past, $2,000 go piss it away, and $2,000 go set up what I would, you break your future down into short-term, mid-term, and long-term. And, you know, and I go through this in, in both of my books, I have that concept down. Because why hit all six of those cylinders at the same time? Because they're all parts of who you are. And if you only focus on your debt, so some people be like, I got to clean up my past. I got, they're, they're like OCD about, you know, your addiction now is to pay off your debt really fast, right? Well, the problem is if, Remember, if you think, feel, and speak about anything from your financial past or your past at all, all you do is create more of it in the present moment. So that's why I want you to just only put two grand in that example that I gave to your past because I just want you to do that, let it go, don't think about it anymore, and they're like, okay, where am I going to piss away my own And where am I going to plant the seeds for the future from a short-term, mid-term, and long-term perspective? And so... By addressing all of those at the same time, what you do is you create this financial container for yourself that is safe. Because if you do it like just paying off all your past, you don't feel safe in the present moment because you're still feeling lack and scarcity because you're not getting what you need in the present moment to satisfy those emotions that are recreating all your financial screw-ups. Right? And it's we're constantly working towards creating a safe financial container. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't, I was just ignoring my debt and um, I would invest a lot in like courses and stuff like that. And so I do think, well, my wealth is like a lot of wisdom. <laughs> um, but yeah, I see what you mean now, like making an equal split of it and like because ignoring your past. What you needed to, so if in that moment, Let's say you did it differently. So in that moment, you said, okay, I'm not gonna ignore my debt, but you, your debt is there because there are emotions that you haven't felt that created that debt in the first place. So by you actually taking some money in the present moment, you're not burying your feelings, you're working through them as you sprinkle more over there. That's why declaring bankruptcy never works. Because you're going to create the same pile of crap you did last time because you didn't build the muscles to not do it again. Right? So it's about build the muscles. Right? And and I find that when people um, have debt, like if that is a structure that you've bought into and that you, which is the majority of people, right? You have, usually when people pay that debt down, because they decide to finally address it. We always build it up again, and then we pay it down again. Usually it's the third time, because you never get it as high as it once was. You know, it's like this thing that you do to where finally it lets go of its power over you. And you have to allow, some people do it, very few people paid it down once and never create debt ever again. It's usually two or three times that we re start recreating again, going, oh, 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 I'm interrupting the pattern, I'm not doing that again. And then you become more aware because it's about awareness and consciousness, right? And so that, that's when you start to choose differently. So can you talk more about the leaky container? You've talked yeah, about so there's all kinds of leaky containers. So um, there can be leaky containers. Uh, let's just talk about um, 
some of the most common leaking containers, uh, you've got, let's just say you've totally licked your debt patterns and your debt cycles and your cash flows and you're finally like creating, you, you've done the system, right? Like you're, you're rocking and rolling, you don't have any more debt to pay off, you're living in the present moment and creating the future you want. And then you go into a new relationship. Guess who you're going to attract? You're going to attract the person that hasn't done their debt muscle building yet. So that's going to be the lesson of going, <laughs> I ain't going down this pattern again. So then it's about not only holding boundaries for yourself financially, then it's about holding boundaries that you're not willing to be in a relationship with somebody who doesn't hold boundaries in their financial stuff. Because you can't fix it for that other person. Right? Because you don't want to create codependence. Right? So I see that show up in relationships like that. Um, the second codependent, speaking of relationships, is with uh, people's children. Oh, my God. Cut them off the nipple, right? Like, you want to provide for your children, but then you don't know how to have them build their own financial muscles, and then you create fiscally dysfunctional children. And it's like you kind of need to let your children hang themselves a little bit to build their muscles, but you have to have the courage to let them kind of get a nosebleed themselves. That's another uh, leaky container I see a lot. Um, and, and you might be the leaky container with your parents. So it could go either way. It could be your children or it could be you're the child. So if you're the child that is participating in leaky container with your parents, you can say, I appreciate the help, but here's my game plan to stop being a leaky container. Right? So you can start to step stand on your own two feet on your own. Um, the other also with um, a child helping out a parent financially. Yes, that's another leaky container. Because if you are the one help, you have to decide that the day that your parents die, that you showed up in a way that you have no blame or guilt or judgment inside of yourself. And that's going to be different for different people. Some people, it's the fact that you will write the checks. Some people, it's like, oh, I'm not going to um, write the checks, but I will help mom and dad with my time to get them to the best place based on their own financial reality. So, like, you don't necessarily have to be their caretaker, but maybe you get them, you help them get in alignment with what are the resources available based on somebody in their financial situation. You know, so it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you're writing the check. But whatever you do, you have to make sure that you feel good at the end of the day. Like I had a gentleman, parents were divorced, really felt bad for mom. He's the son, right? And had no problem helping mom, you know, with, he was, he actually bought like an insurance policy on his parents that if mom ever needed care, that, you know, long-term care in her older age, like he chose to be proactive and get insurance policy on mom. And if mom didn't ever need the care, he was paid a death benefit. So he actually then got his money back. Like that's a way that you can help parents out. And, um, you know, or you could sit there, his dad, on the other hand, dad created a life where he was, you know, on welfare. And so he helped him get into the welfare system of what beds were available, like based on what dad created. But he was okay with that. He was okay with something completely different for mom than completely different for dad because of where he was in his relationship with his parents, right? So it's about just at the end of the day, doing what you feel resolves it within yourself of showing up how you want to show up without being a codependent. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, kind of. So like, say a parent had like a, a large mortgage or something and they'd mm -hmm. always been struggling with money then the child became wealthy, would you, do you think it's a good idea for the child to pay off that mortgage? Or would, would the child need to change the other en energetic patterns of like help with that too, like send them courses or something like that so they don't run into that again? So fixing it for a parent is no different than fixing it for a child because you will be super frustrated then when your parents don't have a mortgage and you worked really hard for that money and then they go create some other kind of problem in their world financially because they haven't built the muscles to do it differently. So at the end of the day, if you have plenty of money to pay your parents' mortgage and that's what you want to do because 
you're already hitting your goals and desires, this is where the problem is. Most people are doing it at their cost, not because they have that much more of abundance to do it for them. So it's about not doing it at your cost. It has to be an and, not an or. It's like, don't do it for your parents and now you don't have enough money to send your own kids to college or retire at the age that you want to retire at. It has to be, I'm going to help my parents and I'm going to send my kids to college and I'm going to retire on time, mm -hmm. right? So you do both of those things mm -hmm. because you can't, it's kind of like, think of it like the oxygen mask when you get on an airplane, they say, put your ox oxygen mask on first then help everybody else. Mm -hmm. This is no different than with your parents in how you want to do their financials. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to mention one other leaky container that I see on the debt structure. And that is, let's just say you've totally mastered um, your credit card debts. Um, I see this, particularly people who are self-employed. <laughs> oh, this is, you mastered the credit card you got and all of a sudden, you didn't file your taxes right because now they're not taken out of a paycheck and now you owe the government money for taxes. That's just another form of a credit card. So we need to stop bullshitting ourselves, pardon my French, that we need to be mindful that that's almost like a quarterback sneak. It comes up from behind you and you're like, shit, it's like a year later and you're like, I've done so good not creating payments for myself and now I just created it with the tax man. And it's like, oh, so this is how the leaky containers come up. Leaky containers can also be like siblings that you bail out. You know, I have 11 brothers and sisters and my dad has always bailed out his children, always. Well, he was really angry with me when he told me to help my sibling out because they're going to lose their house. And I'm like, maybe she's supposed to lose her house because then maybe she'll choose differently in her life. And he was like so angry with me. They never lost their house. Guess what happened? Husband found, all of a sudden found some money <laughs> and he saved his own house. It's like amazing when put up against, you do a disservice for other souls when you bail them out and not let them live the experience of their own choices. And I learned this a long time ago that one of the best ways you can love somebody financially is actually let them have the experience of their choices because then they have the best possibility to shift and to change. And, but we've never really looked at it from that perspective. And it's like, if you really want to help people that you love, let them sit in what they're creating so they can create differently. You know, and it's not that you want anything bad to happen to those people, but if you're able to help them build the muscle and take care of yourself, and help them out well that's the ideal mix because all of that is abundant you're not participating in any scarcity otherwise does that make sense yeah yeah and so why do why do people fear the lack so much like because i did um i did a breathwork ceremony recently um and it took me back i asked about abundance and it took me back to the first time that i did breath work and i felt like i died and i lost everything but i was okay and i realized at that point like oh there really is nothing to fear and like the clinging to the abundance was the problem um, well it, it's trust right mm -hmm. And, and, and we, we don't trust that. So our minds keep us in this suffering cycle. This is why I always talk to people about their body intelligence, because you have to start to, and it's not taught. I, I'm highly educated, formally educated, highly formally educated. I was never, ever taught to trust my own gut and my own intuition above everything else that we are supposed to bring it to our brains and evaluate it out. Like, I can't tell you how many people come to me and say, well, I picked the allocation I have in my retirement plan with my employer because that's what the other people who I work with do. Or this is what my family does. It's like, we don't even put these decisions through our own filter. We think somebody else's filter is better than our own filter because we feel on some level we're flawed in some way. And we're not, we are perfectly designed 
exactly the way we're meant to be to experience what we're supposed to experience in this lifetime. And this is where it's not that you're not smart about it. It's like filter it first through your heart and your gut, then add your smarts. The problem is we just add the smarts and we've left our hearts on the sidelines. But we have to bring both along for the way. And this is why we have this scarcity and, and afraid of that lack and everything because we're doing it all from up here because your heart's going, hey, what about me? Hey, what about me? It's like, wake up, I'm here. Will you take me along for the ride? We just have to choose to take it along for the ride and say, how do I feel about that? And, the, and when you're first starting to build that muscle to trust your, your, your body intelligence, particularly when it comes to your money, is if you choose this path, does your body relax or do you go to anxiety? Does it make you giggle or does it stress you out? Follow the giggle, follow the calmness, follow the thing that makes you feel centered. Now, what will naturally happen? You're gonna go to your head and go, well, I don't know how to do that. And I'm not really sure how it's going to work out. Da -da 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 -da, like the monkey mind. Da -da 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 -da. I need you to say, you know what? I can appreciate that my mind has led me to all the successes that I've had thus far, but I need to kind of put that over here and I just need to trust myself over here. And I'm not really sure why. Like I have experiences where I, you know, in my divorce process, I did not take my attorney's recommendations. I went with what my gut was. And every time I trusted my gut, amazing things unpacked. But my fear, because lawyers feed on fear, right? And I just was like, you know what? I'm just going to trust that this is all happening for a reason. And you just have to surrender into that trust. And surrender is a, I think, a lifelong process. I think you continue to um, peel layers and onions. That's why we did the work we did in Costa Rica, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's, um, it's just about how do we get to that next place? And it's beautiful. Yeah, I will say one thing that in Costa Rica that you said to, to me before, because we, we did ayahuasca, um, before we did it, I said to you um, how I would like I find myself in a lot of luxurious places or like I, I get a lot of stuff for free. And yep. you asked, how does that make me feel? And I said, it makes me feel lucky. And you said, no, you should feel deserving. And and then that like came through again and again. And I was so like, it's that like, lands, right? Because yeah. lucky is outside of yourself. Mm right it's got it's got to land inside otherwise you stay in the same cycle you've been in and until you expand that deserving button your lucky can't get any better than it was right you expand your deserving button holy crap you're way more luckier than you've ever been because the lucky is just the result of the deserving the belief of how much you believe you deserve and that's how you shift from the income affluence to the asset affluence because you believe you deserve more right? That's why you can never manifest anything outside of yourself, like your net worth, unless you believe some st stuff in the inside. Because your outside world, your, your amount of income you have, the amount of assets you have, is just a reflection of how you feel about yourself. It's about your self-love and your self-care. It's huge. Yeah, huge, huge, huge. Okay, well, thank you so much. Oh, you you're welcome, Connie. <laughs> Happy to help. <laughs> you know I love to talk about what I love to talk about. <laughs> okay. So do you have any, um, well, do you, is there anything that you wish you had known when you were younger um, that you could, if you could tell your younger self now? Yeah, just don't drink the juice of what the outside world's trying to tell you. You know, when I look back at when I started my business, all I did was follow my intuition. All I did was follow my gut. And then it wasn't until I got more established and it really started rocking and rolling that I got off the treadmill of following my own intuition. And I, and I learned some lessons along the way and they became my suffering patterns. It was like, just, I could only imagine where it would be today if I wouldn't have got off the rails of just following my own gut because that's when the magic happens. That's when the quantum leaps happen. Mm -hmm. And and doing that today, you know, now, you know, 
this may will be my 29th year being a financial planner and uh, hard to believe that I've been doing this for 29 years but I've seen a lot done a lot and you just need no matter what the outside noise is people or experiences or whatever you need to just go yeah but I kind of got to go over here and I'm not really sure why I had so many people tell me in my industry like oh you're cute but you're just kind of like a one-hit wonder jewel and then I realized oh I don't have five billion in assets under management right now so they're not gonna listen to me until I do well I'm now quantum leaping past people and I'm asked to speak on all these panels and do all these things because they're like what the hell is she doing you know and it's, it's like because I stopped believing all this bullshit that everyone else was telling me because that was their story through their hourglass of how they feel about themselves it had nothing to do with me but we can so easily take it on like it's our own and it's our not and it's not especially if you're an empath just allow other people's stuff to be other people's stuff and stay in your lane stay in your knowing that's the biggest thing that i would say yeah yeah because i um i was uh around someone who was very wealthy recently but um, had a lot of fear around lack and um, and I just I internalized that as ah oh, this is like an old part of my subconscious coming up that I need to just send love to him and that yep. old part of me in order to release it so. and I would add to the love it's also compassion to send to that person because um, and, and, and the wish that they find that peace and harmony within themselves because that too raises the grid for everybody. That's beautiful. Well, thank yeah. you so much. So where Thanks, can people honey. find you? Yeah, you can go to juliemurphy.com. I send out a blog uh, twice a week and certainly go to my YouTube channel, uh, subscribe and hit that notification bell. And we'll let you know when I'm on. Yeah, so your YouTube is called Awaken with Julie. Is that Awaken correct? with Julie, yeah. And, and your Instagram too, Awaken with yep. Julie. Yep, yep, Awaken with Julie. Okay, Got well, it. Great. thank you. If you're watching on YouTube right now, please subscribe and like and comment with any questions. And um, if you're listening on any podcast platform, please subscribe and leave a review if possible. That really helps. Awesome. So thank you so much, Julie. It's been you're so welcome. And also I was on Julie's podcast, uh, podcast and um, YouTube channel. So you can go and check that episode out, which is coming out soon, I believe. Yes. So Awaken with Julie and you can follow me everywhere at Connie Rose Coaching. Thank you, everyone. Right. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.